Okay, so this was our initial measurement, uh, which we did at cost. So remember that initial measurement for all assets. Initial measurement, which means on the date of acquisition, is always at cost model. Then you have subsequent measurement, okay? You call it subsequent measurement. Subsequent measurement means the measurement on the financial reporting date. Uh, you are preparing financial statements on 31st of December or 30th of June, whatever. So how much you are going to measure it? So for IS-16 PPE, you have two models. It allows you to do cost model or you can do the revaluation model. Two models you have, two options. It says either you do cost model. So the cost model, what does it say? Cost model says that you can, the initial cost, you have the initial cost, uh, initial cost, less accumulated depreciation and any impairment losses. So which means that if I purchase the assets for 1 million, okay, and then I had my first year depreciation as, I don't know, 200. So my net book value is 800. This is called net book value or this is called carrying value. Next year, again, I have a depreciation of 200 and I record it at 600. This is called my net book value or you can call it book value. You can call it carrying value. So this is called cost model. In between, if you have any impairment, impairment IS 36, we will discuss it later. Impairment is a sudden decrease in the value of an asset. If there is any impairment, that impairment should also be subtracted. So this is actually called an entity specific method. Entity specific measurement. Because I am not considering the asset, what is its value in the market? I just say that I purchased it for 1 million and I assume that it has a five years life so 200, 200 is being depreciated every year and I am putting it 800, next year 600, then 400, then 200, and then it will be zero. And this is entity specific because this is my estimate. This is my measurement. It has got nothing to do with the market. This is called cost model, okay? Now, now apart from cost model, IFRS IS-16, also allows you to use the revaluation model. It is your choice which method, which method you are going to use. And I will tell you how will you make your choice, okay? Again, when you have two options and you have to choose between, so you call it your accounting policy, but your accounting policy should have some rationale. It should have some logic. You cannot say that, okay, I'm doing cost, I'm doing cost. I, I have a right to ask you why, okay? Revaluation model, you have the second option. In revaluation model, what you do, revaluation model, we say that property plan and equipment is carried in the financial statement at fair value, less accumulated depreciation and impairment losses. So it means that when you purchased it for 1 million, then you depreciated it for 200, it became 800. Then you depreciated, and then what happened? that it was 800, but then you thought, what is the market? Market might be 900. So you add 100 here to make it 900, and then you depreciate based on 900. So it says that you take it at fair value, less any accumulated depreciation. So then you starting it like, okay, 800, I added revaluation. How do we add it? That's a separate topic I will explain. But the thing is that this is called market specific measurement because i'm not thinking only about my internal calculation i see how much is the asset in my books it is 800 how much is the asset in the market it is 900 so let's take 900 so it's a market specific measurement and then i remeasure it to 900 and then i start charging the depreciation again I start charging the depreciation again based on the new valuation and that new valuation is 900. So actually what you have here in cost model, you say cost minus accumulated depreciation 
minus impairment. In your revaluation model, you say revalued amount minus accumulated depreciation and minus impairment. The only difference is that here you take the asset on the initial cost here you are adjusting the asset with the market, with the fair value, the revaluation amount, which you call the fair value. Understand, revalued amount is the market price, which is the fair value. This is the difference. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, just yes, for, for the sake of a little comparison, although I'm sure that I'm going to explain it in more detail later, IS-16, which is your PPE, and IS 40, which is your investment property I discussed in the beginning, your initial measurement is cost here and cost here in both methods. But subsequent measurement is cost here and revaluation model here. Here, subsequent measurement could be cost and could be fair value. Here it is, could be cost, could be revaluation, not really a big emphasis. But here, there is a big emphasis, try to take it at fair value. If you do at fair value, that's fine. But if you cannot do fair value for some reason, then you can use the cost model. Now, what is the difference between revaluation model and fair value? The difference is both will have the same value, like revaluation model also take fair value. It is also based on fair value. Revalued amount is the fair value of the asset. It is also fair value. Then what is the difference? The difference is that fair value, there is method means you take the market price, but no depreciation. In fair value model, you take the market price, but no depreciation. But in revalue, you do make the depreciation. If you remember, I told you in the beginning that I have an office on the seventh floor, which was for 100K. I have an office on the fourth floor, which was also for 100K. This I will use my in my office. So this was my IES 16. And this is my IES 40. I'm not going to use it in the market. I'm not going to use it in the business. So this one, I will do depreciation of 20. Here, I will not do any depreciation. End of the year, it becomes 80 end of the year, it remains 100. Because revalue, because in investment property, you take fair value with no depreciation. But then you make a revaluation. When you do a revaluation, in market, this office now is 120. So you now, from 80, you revalue it to 120 and take that difference to your statement of comprehensive income. And this, you also make 120. And now from the next year, you will again charge depreciation here, but here there will be no depreciation. This is the main difference. When you use fair value model in IS 40, this is for IS 40, you don't charge depreciation. There is no depreciation. But in IS 16, when you revalue the asset, after revaluation, the new value of the asset, you start charging depreciation. So this is, major difference between revaluation model. Uh, what is the fair value of an asset? Land and building, take the market value. Plant and equipment, take the market value. Specialized assets, specialized assets, depreciated because these, they don't have a market value. Specialized asset means an asset which has been specially constructed for you, or maybe an asset which does not have an active value. So depreciated replacement cost if the market value is not available. Now, when do you do revaluation? Now, imagine that we have IS-16. Under IS-16, I have got my land and building. I have my motor vehicles. I have my furniture. I have my plant and equipment. So again, IS-16 allows you to use a different method for a different class of asset. For example, for land and building, we use revaluation model. For motor vehicle, I will use cost model. For furniture, I will use cost model. For plant and equipment, I will use revaluation model. So generally speaking, if you can see here, the bigger items, 
the bigger items which could make a material difference those i'm taking on revaluation model but if i talk about furniture i use cost model because revaluation model means that you have to hire a third party a revaluing company who will come and make an assessment of the value of your asset and give you a written valuation report otherwise you cannot do it yourself you cannot say that oh my furniture was 100 now it is 120 it is not on your sweet will you need a documentation because when you put 100 you have a document for that if you want to increase 20 you need to have a document for that you can't just record an entry without a document and that document will be given by a valuation agent and he will charge you some fee and does that is, is it pain taking is it worth pain taking or is it worth giving that money so motor vehicles furniture and other small assets computer equipment take the cost model because it will not have material impact but if you talk about land and building or if you talk about plant and equipment which is in millions of dollars then you do revaluation thing and is 16 it tells you that you should do frequent revaluations probably every year if not every year then every three years to reflect the true market value of this asset because why are we preparing financials we are preparing financials for to present it to our shareholders and other users in 2010 you purchased a property for 1 million now it is two now not 2010 let's call it 2016 now it is 2021 five years have passed can you still tell your shareholders that it is 1 million or if you tell in your balance sheet that it is 1 million you are using cost model and then you depreciate it something or somehow and you make it like 700,000 and I give it to my shareholders that this asset is 700,000 after depreciation or whatever and he would say I don't believe it because in market I know that people are paying or buying or selling the similar asset for 2 million why are you telling me 0.7 million you are not reporting me correct your information is not correct and then you will be embarrassed so because you have to present the correct information so it is important that those significant assets which have material changes in their value those must be revalued but as far as these small assets are concerned you can go with the cost model it tells you is gives you both both of these uh, options but of course we need to make some logic and reason behind that so revaluation now when you do revaluation what happens so first of all what happened you had an asset for 1 million you depreciated it for 200 it becomes 800000 then you depreciated it for 200 it becomes 600000 this is your net book value at the end of year 2 and then you find out that market value is again 800 let's call it 700000 market value is 700000 so you need to add 100k here you need to add 100k here in this how to say you have a revaluation gain and then asset should become 700 in your books and then you should depreciate the asset based on 700 which is the the how to say remaining life now it has got some double entries uh, and it has got some uh, revaluation gain calculation uh, that which is like actually not for the purpose of BIPA EFR exam uh, or your SBR exam we don't use this thing there but I want you people to learn these double entries and I want you people to learn how to calculate the revaluation gain what is the treatment we call it new depreciation then we call it extra depreciation and then we have a treatment of extra depreciation so there are three four areas which you need to find out one so first of all you uh, for the purpose of this lecture you should only remember that the revaluation gain will be the difference between the book value which is 600000 
and the market value, which is 700,000. And then you need to recognize this gain and you calculate the new depreciation, you calculate the extra depreciation and you calculate the treatment of this extra depreciation. Uh, this is, uh, like I said that it is not within the scope of my today's lesson. What I'm going to do, I'm going to upload here another video, which is for 18 minutes. And I have explained this procedure there. So you guys are requested to watch that video of revaluation of non-current asset. I will upload that video tonight on your course page. So that is an extra thing. I would suggest you watch it from there. For me, what is important here that if we have got this 100K revaluation, we call it revaluation gain, okay? Gain on revaluation. So where does it go? Now that's a gain. And remember that it is called an unrealized gain. Unrealized gain because it has not been converted to cash. The asset is still being used in the business. And if the asset has gone up today, there is a possibility that asset might come down tomorrow. And then it may go up today, tomorrow, and then may go up and then come down. Market values, they keep on changing. So, and we are using the asset. We, are, we have not sold it. It is unrealized gain. Where do you show it? You put it as in OCI, other comprehensive income. Other comprehensive income. And it like you remember that the statement of comprehensive, the bottom line, other comprehensive income. And on this revaluation gain, you also need to calculate your deferred tax because that's a gain. And it will give rise to deferred tax treatment. When we will do IS-12, I will explain you the deferred tax treatment as well. And this amount will be shown under your equity section. If you remember on the balance sheet, on the balance sheet, you have here reserves. Within the reserves, this 100 will be shown. Revaluation surplus account, we call it. So it comes in credit your <clears throat> and your debit, your non-current asset, value goes up and credit your revaluation surplus account. And this revaluation surplus account is on your equity side of the balance sheet. So what we understand from here, that there is a possibility that the market value of asset goes up and that is called an unrealized gain. It is shown in the OCI, other comprehensive income. It is shown in the OCI, other comprehensive income. And then it is also shown on the balance sheet under the equity section where we have reserves. Now, there is one exception which you need to understand. There is one exception. The exception is that it is possible that in past there was some impairment of this asset. It is possible that last year this asset had a $20,000 impairment and that impairment we took to PL. Now you remember the difference between PL because you've got here this part of the balance sheet uh, income statement. The top part was PL, the bottom part was OCI part. Okay. Remember that thing? Other comprehensive income, top part, bottom part we discussed. Impairment we already charged minus 20 here in the past. Last year, asset value went down by 20 asset lost some value, I considered it as a loss and I took it into my PNL 20 minus. The next year, which is this year, it has gone up by 100. So then what should I do? First, I should reverse this thing. So I will put now because this thing has happened. So in the current year, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put 20 here plus because I treated it last year as a minus and 80 I will put here. This is what you need to understand. That if this asset did not have any past impairment, if it did not have past impairment, then all of 100 will come to OCI. But if it did have some past impairment, let's suppose 20, then the same amount of 20 you will put into PNL to justify, to rectify, to adjust or to correct you put it because I treated related to this asset. I recorded a loss in my PNL. Remember, I'm a manager and I always protect my PNL part. Unfortunately, last year it was 20. I recorded it as a loss. 
So this year when it goes up, don't you think I'm going to claim it? I will claim it that listen, this asset I recorded a loss. So actually, if you consider, you say that asset has gone up 100, asset has not gone up 100, asset has gone up only 80. 20 is the recovered amount because it was here. From here, it went down a little bit, 20, and now it has come up like this 100. So within this 100, this is 20, which is the recovery, and this is 80. So 20 is the recovered loss. So I put it into my PL, and only 80 is the increase. Am I clear on this agenda? Very clear. But 20 is the recovered amount because it was before it was like, I don't know, 700. So from 700, last year it became 680. And now it has come to 780. So don't tell me that 100 has gone up. Actually, 20 is the recovery. And then only 80 has gone up. So on my OCI, I will take 80. And 20, I will take in PNL because last year I got the hit. I got the hit. This year I will recover my hit. This is your treatment of revaluation. Now the double. So what entries... should be the hello? Yeah. Sorry, sir. So what should be the description of uh, the the line that you show as the re recovery of uh, past impairment loss as in PNL? So I will actually when I will take it i will my credit my pnl so i will say debit my non current asset 100 and credit my revaluation surplus 80 and credit my pnl 80 20 okay got it the double entry you were asking them yeah, yeah, yeah you were asking yeah, the double yeah. entry for this so i need to what yeah, i need yeah. to do now the double entries here i'm just showing you as brief okay i would suggest you that video which i told you because that had all the double entries here i'm just telling you as like a concept as a concept you've got non-current assets going up by 100 which is your increase in the value of asset and you would say uh, this is nca non-current asset revaluation surplus will go 80 which is oci and credit my pnl by 20 because i want to take 20 credit to my pnl so this is about revaluation um see here this is what it is i was explaining you a revaluation loss which means impairment is charged first to comprehensive income with any excess reported to profit or loss um, when asset is revalued depreciation is charged on the revalued amount so new depreciation you need to calculate if the asset value goes up from 800 to 900 depreciation will be on the new amount if the asset has been revalued upward the depreciation charge will be higher than before the revaluation of course because before i was depreciating 800 so depreciation was 200 now i'm charging depreciation on 900 probably it is 250 depreciation will go up the excess depreciation 50. We call it excess depreciation. What do we do with that? This excess depreciation. Now, this is actually the same topic which I was telling you, you should be watching that video. After just below this video, I'm going to put that additional video and you will, and that video name is revaluation of non-current assets. Uh, the only thing which I need to explain you here, the reason, what happened? See here. Now, please pay attention. My asset was 800. I was charging depreciation 200 to my PNL. Then my asset increased to 900, and I started charging 250 as depreciation to my PNL. Then I go to the shareholders and I say that I've got a good news for you. We made a hundred dollar revaluation gain or hundred thousand revaluation gain. They say, what does that mean? I say, we had an asset for 800 and the value of asset has become now 900. So we, go, we gain 100,000. That's good for us. And the shareholders will say, can you give us this 900? Are you going to distribute it to us? And I say, no, I'm not going to distribute it to you because that is an unrealized gain. I don't have cash to give it to you. And the shareholders probably will be disappointed that there was a good news, but you are not giving us money. I say, yes, because it is unrealized. Yes, what I can do, 
that I can put it into equity part. You remember equity? Equity is the money which belongs to you guys. I'm going to put it in reserves, 100. So your equity will increase. And when this asset will be sold, I will give you the money. When asset will be sold, it will be sold at a higher price. You will get the benefit then. Until then, it will be shown in the reserves. So it's your money, but on the books. They say, okay, fine, we are happy, no problem. But then when I show them profit, profit has gone down. And the shareholders will say, why profit has gone down? I say, because I charged more depreciation. And they would say, why did you charge more depreciation? I say, because I revalued the asset. And they will be really pissed off. They say that, listen, you came to us with the good news of revalue, but you did not give us anything. Instead of that, you are decreasing our profit. So this revaluation is not giving us any benefit because it is actually decreasing my profit. And from profit, I take dividends because if the profit goes down, the dividends will go down. As a result of revaluation, profit has gone down. And once the profit is down, my dividend is down. What do I do with this revaluation? I don't need it. So then I will tell them that, listen, what is the problem? The dispute is only how much extra depreciation I charge. I charge extra depreciation of only $50. This is the issue. So this is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it back to you. So what I did before, what I did before, when I created this revaluation surplus, I said, debit non-current asset 100 and i said credit revaluation surplus revaluation surplus 100. now i say i'm going to give you this 50 back i cannot put it into the income statement <coughs> but i have a treatment for it <coughs> and the treatment is i make a double entry <coughs> debit revaluation surplus by 50 the extra depreciation and credit retained earnings. So where the, where the dividends are taken, the dividends are taken from retained earnings. Okay. You take out your dividends from retained earnings account. So I transfer this amount, which I credited before this amount, which I credited before. Now I'm going to debit it. So I am decreasing the revaluation surplus account. I'm transferring the money from here to retained earnings so that you can take out your dividends. So this $50 was an extra depreciation into the income statement. I must show it. This is what the IES tells me. But then I give you this money through this adjustment. I make an adjustment which will be shown in the changes in equity. So after making this double entry, revaluation surplus account will go down retained earnings will go up so that 50 dollar difference will be absorbed you should be happy and by the way this is not necessary this treatment this double entry it is not compulsory it is your option is does not tell you that you must do it it depends on the company policy that do you want to transfer now what do we call it we call it transferring of extra depreciation from revaluation account to retained earning account. So you might read a situation in exam that the company has a policy of transferring the extra depreciation from revaluation to retained earning. If they say the company has a policy, you understand they are making this double entry. Or they might say the company does not have the policy of transferring the extra depreciation so you understand that revaluation account will remain 100 always so this is all about revaluation when you will watch that 18 minute video actually you would understand that what i've spoken now it does cover that 60 70 percent of that thing but i would still suggest that you watch that video so this is all about here and then you've got uh, depreciation methods now, you know that depreciation methods are two. I don't want to speak a lot about that. You've got straight line method. You've got reducing balance method. In straight line method, you charge equal depreciation every year. Equal depreciation every year. 
In reducing balance method, the first years depreciation are more. And as the, you continue in later years, the depreciation becomes less. What is depreciation? <coughs> the definition of depreciation. <coughs> <clears throat> we say that it is a systematic allocation of the depreciable amount of an asset over its estimated useful life. I can also call it like this. I can also write it like this, that it is the systematic allocation of the loss in the value of an asset over its estimated useful life. For example, you purchased an asset. The cost of the asset was 100. And uh, then you have life of the asset, which is four years. And then you have the residual value of the asset, which is 20. So your depreciable amount, we call it depreciable amount is 80. So this 80 is actually the loss in the value of an asset because the asset will become from 100 to 20 over a period of four years. So this 80 is a loss, but this loss you are not incurring in one year. You are incurring over a period of four years. So it means that you are making a loss of 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 20 over a period of four years. This is called depreciation. That is a concept of accruals. Depreciation comes under accrual concept. Accruals means that expenses, income and expenses should be charged to the period to which they belong. So 80 does not belong to one year. Actually, every year it is 20. So I split it. So the formula is cost minus residual value divided by life. And cost was 100, residual value was 20 divided by 4, which means 20 depreciation. This is called straight line method because in straight line method, you are charging equal depreciation every year. And for calculating straight line depreciation, you subtract the residual value. If the residual value is not given in a question, you take it at zero. Always remember, there are two methods, straight line method, and, resi and res reducing balance method. If the question does not tell you which method to use, you will always use straight line method. You will only use reducing balance if the question tells you specifically that use reducing balance method. If the question does not say reducing balance, you use straight line. If the question does not say revaluation uh, residual value, you take it at zero. Okay. And I explained you before that those assets which bring equal benefit, you take straight line method. Those assets where the benefit will decrease after a certain period of time, where the benefit decreases as the assets become old, in that case, you use reducing balance method. One question, which is not really very technical, but it's important to understand, when do you start charging depreciation? You start charging depreciation when the asset becomes available for use. Okay. So sometimes some students say that when you purchase the asset, answer is purchase the asset. No. They say when you use the asset, answer is no. Answer is when it is available for use, which means that it can be used now, which means that it is ready for use. Only then you will start charging depreciation. Before that, you cannot. Imagine that you are making a building. So this is going to be finished in two years time or maybe in three years time. So end of year one, this much of building is finished. You already have spent 5 million. This 5 million is in your balance sheet, already shown as non-current asset. But because the building is not finished, no depreciation. Then you come to year two, and you finish some further part of the building. In your balance sheet, the asset now is already 8 million. 
but it is not yet completed. So no depreciation. The day the asset becomes completed, the day the asset is available for use, you start charging depreciation. Now, whether you use it or you do not use it, it does not matter. It does not matter, okay? Use or not use. This is of no concern. What is important that it is ready for use. If it is ready for use, you must depreciate. For example, you have got a car, you've got a truck, which is parked outside. You are not using it, but you must depreciate it because it is available for use. So this is about the depreciation thing. Uh, depreciation goes to your income statement. It is an operating expense. And uh, then what in under cost model, what you do. So remember you had 1000 and I said year one depreciation 200 and it becomes 800. Double entry was debit depreciation expense 200 credit accumulated depreciation 200 and then next year it is again 200 depreciated and now it becomes 600 you again say debit depreciation expense 200 and credit accumulated depreciation 200 that's how you do it and when you have your trial balance in your trial balance it is shown as like this asset 1 million and accumulated depreciation on this asset 400. Asset is always on the debit side of the trial balance. Accumulated depreciation is shown on the credit side of the trial balance. And in your balance sheet, in your statement of financial position, you will write down 1000 minus 400, 600. In your balance sheet, you will write down always you will show if we are doing the cost model 600. 1000 minus 400 because debit is asset credit is accumulated depreciation you subtract total 1000 minus 400 this goes to your non current assets 600 okay next is is 40 investment property 